So uh, Dr. Rob Radke uh, has served as the uh, president of Episcopal Relief and Development since 2005. Prior to that, he served in various senior level posts at the Asia Society. In his role as president, Rob has overseen a number of major initiatives, including Nets for Life, the agency's award-winning flagship malaria prevention program, which to date has reached over 41 million people in 17 African countries, and the U.S. Disaster Preparedness and Response Program, which helps Episcopal dioceses, congregations, and other church institutions to both prepare for and respond to disasters in their local communities. Rob provides strategic leadership to the agency's programs in nearly 40 countries across Africa, Latin America, and Asia, as well as the United States. Episcopal Relief and Development has been a pioneer in the area of asset-based community development in a faith-based context with programs that mobilize local resources in an integrated approach to promote health, alleviate hunger, create economic opportunities, and respond to disaster. The organization has been recognized with major awards and grants from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation. Uh, Rob is a trustee of the Anglican Alliance for Development, Relief, and Advocacy. He also serves on the board of the Joint Learning Initiative on Faith and Local Communities and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Rob has a bachelor degree from Columbia College of Columbia University and a doctorate, a doctorate of philosophy from New College of the University of Oxford, which he attended as a Rhodes Scholar. In 2012, he received an honorary doctorate of divinity degree from Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Please join me in welcoming Rob Rackley. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, as I said uh, in my sermon, this is a hugely uh, generous parish to Episcopal Relief and Development, so it's a real honor to be able to come here uh, and thank you all uh, personally, but also to share with you some of the good works of Episcopal Relief and Development that you've made possible. So there's a brief uh, film, five to seven minutes, which gives you kind of the top line overview of Episcopal Relief and Development, introduces some of our main programs, and then afterwards I want to update you a little bit on our response to the terrible series of disasters uh, that we've all been reading about uh, over the last uh, four to six weeks. And then uh, let's have a conversation because that's really what's most interesting to me is what's on your minds um, and uh, any questions that you might have. So without further ado, we'll watch the video and then uh, continue after that. That's good. Moved to action by the words of Jesus in Matthew 25, Episcopal Relief and Development, formerly the Presiding Bishop's Fund for World Relief, joins with Anglican Communion and ecumenical partners in nearly 40 countries to tackle some of the most critical issues facing communities worldwide. How do we care for the earth? How do we make communities more resilient in the face of disease and natural disaster? How do we empower those most vulnerable, respecting the dignity of every human being? Inspired by the Sustainable Development Goals, Episcopal Relief and Development is working internationally to reach more than three million people each year, supporting asset-based community development in four core areas. Alleviating hunger, promoting health, creating economic opportunities, and responding to disasters. Internationally, our programs are multifaceted, combining core areas with themes such as gender awareness and resilience building into holistic strategies for growth. We alleviate hunger and improve food supply by empowering families to raise healthy animals and use climate-smart agricultural practices. We promote health and fight disease by training health workers to educate and mobilize their communities around integrated health issues such as malaria, maternal and child health, nutrition, and clean water. We create economic opportunities and strengthen communities by promoting savings groups that support microloans, vocational training, and small business development. And we respond to disasters and rebuild communities by reaching those most at risk and accompanying them through a full and sustained recovery. 
Internationally, we support emergency response efforts through local partners and our Disaster Risk Reduction Toolkit. In the United States, we connect, equip, and inspire church leaders to prepare for and respond to disasters. You can help these efforts by filling out your church's profile on the Episcopal Asset Map. Our goal is to help you live your faith and connect to global mission through a trusted organization that shares your values, compassion, justice, and wholeness. You can connect with our work throughout the year with worship and Christian formation resources, walk in love, and special opportunities during the seasons of Lent and Advent. Lent is a time to remember Episcopal Relief and Development with our annual Lenten Meditation Series and Worship Resources for Episcopal Relief and Development Sunday. During Advent, many congregations use Gifts for Life to connect holiday gift giving with making a difference in an area close to their hearts. We give thanks to our participants and partners around the world who for more than 75 years have used their talents and gifts to lift up those around them and help communities thrive. Health promoters like Catherine in Zambia support caregivers of children who have been affected by HIV and AIDS. Agricultural promoters like Octavio and Juana in Nicaragua increase their community's ability to feed their families while protecting the environment. Savings Group's members like Maridula in India invest in small businesses and earn income to improve their homes and provide for their children's education. We support faith leaders around the world as they offer care and compassion to people in times of disaster and on the road to recovery. Your commitment to upholding the dignity of every human being touches millions of lives each year, and we thank you for your prayers and support. Episcopal Relief and Development is a way to be a part of what Presiding Bishop Curry calls the Jesus Movement in a global context, seeking and serving Christ in all people near and far. The theme, Healing a Hurting World, really is at the heart of the work of Episcopal Relief and Development. That we, as people of faith, refuse to be satisfied with the world as it is, but are unceasingly committed to the world as God dreams and intends for it to be. It takes all hands to heal a hurting world. Together, let's create the future that God envisions for us. Great, thank you very much. So, um, let me just update you a little bit about our response to the recent disasters. Um, as the film indicates, you know, we work uh, with churches and dioceses across the United States on preparedness activities, helping churches and dioceses understand that in the event of a disaster, what is it that our ministry is likely to be? Because in our experience, uh, houses of worship are the first places people turn to in times of disaster, and long after the cameras have gone home, houses of worship continue to do what we do. We continue to serve the communities around us. So when it came to the most recent disasters, starting with Harvey, uh, in, um, in, in Texas, and then um, uh, the, the Irma and Maria, we got into action even before the hurricanes hit. So we mobilized uh, through the Diocese of uh, Texas, in this case, and the Diocese of West Texas, the clergy. Uh, we equipped the diocese with communications tools so that they could be in touch with their clergy, because we understood that phones and things like that were likely to go down as a result. We pre-positioned, we, we sent money in advance to uh, pre-position uh, commodities, things like water, uh, clean water, uh, and other things that people tend to need in the early uh, onslaught, uh, onslaught of a disaster. Uh, and then we all hold our breath, as we all do, as the disaster hits. And then as soon as things lift, uh, we uh, begin to equip the church to supply and to help people who are turning to them. The easiest way for that to happen is through, uh, at least in the context of the United, United States, is through cash cards. So churches and clergy go out into their communities or the communities come to them and they offer that kind of immediate support so that people can replace the clothes that they've lost. People can uh, buy the water that they need. People can get the diapers that they want. So rather than actually giving them things, we give them cash or cash cards or gas cards so that they're able to become self-sufficient more quickly. They're able to get economy, uh, money back into the local economy. 
uh, which is another thing that, of course, has happened in a disaster is everything is closed. And it's really important to get local stores running again, to get local restaurants running again, to get local gas stations running again. So that is our typical response uh, in the times of disaster here in the United States. Um, I will say that the disaster in uh, the Caribbean, and particularly uh, in the Virgin Islands, has posed some really, really complex challenges. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Diocese of the Virgin Islands, which uh, encompasses not only the US Virgin Islands, but also encompasses the British Virgin Islands. So we have a diocese here that is actually under jurisdiction of two sovereign and separate countries, uh, which makes it very difficult <laughs> to coordinate. Uh, the US government is, of course, the ones that we would coordinate with uh, on the side of the US Virgin Islands. And the British Virgin Islands, it would be the British government. Unfortunately, the British government, in the case of the British Virgin Islands, was not paying particularly close attention to Virgin Gorda. Uh, and so Episcopal Relief and Development uh, stood up and uh, began to push through uh, the Anglican Alliance, which we're part of, uh, to ensure that the British Red Cross uh, would begin to bring supplies into these places. Um, because cash cards aren't going to work in that context, there's nothing there. It's all been destroyed. Uh, it's very hard for people to uh, um, get access uh, to the things that they need. So uh, Episcopal Relief and Development, uh, in coordination with some other NGOs, uh, began to organize uh, supply ships uh, to supply places like the Virgin, uh, British Virgin Gorda. And in fact, we arranged for uh, 100,000 liters of water and other supplies, cooking tents, uh, and all things to be put on a barge and sent to the British Virgin Islands. Uh, it got there just in advance of uh, Maria. They got it about a third unloaded. Uh, and then they had to send it back out to sea because of the oncoming hurricane. It's now come back, of course, and is unloading. Uh, the same is true for the US Virgin Islands. Um, the only air, at least up until a couple of days ago, the only air bridge, air connection to the US Virgin Islands was through uh, the US government um, and charter flights. So we have been uh, purchasing commodities here in the United States, putting them on our charter flights, and sending it into uh, the uh, US Virgin Islands. And then what we do is we get the US church or the US parishes on that end, uh, or in the case of uh, the Episcopal parishes in the British Virgin Islands, to be the conduit out into the community. So the church people come to the airport or to the port to take the commodities and help distribute them to the people who are most in need. I mean, that's the initial um, uh, uh, relief phase of, of this work. And that's gonna go on uh, because of the level of the destruction uh, for um, months. Uh, particularly in the, uh, in the Virgin Islands and the Caribbean. Uh, eventually, hopefully, we'll move to uh, reconstruction. Uh, I expect in Texas, uh, there's going to be a lot of house gutting that needs to happen. Mold is going to be a terrible, as already is, a terrible problem. Uh, people's homes uh, have been uh, you know, sitting in water, many of them for days, if not weeks. Um, that was similar, of course, to the situation we faced after Katrina in New Orleans and Episcopal Relief and Development uh, partnered in that case with the Diocese of New Orleans for many years, uh, helping them organize uh, groups, church groups to come in and do uh, gutting. And the same was true on the Gulf Coast. I don't know how many of you heard of Camp Coast Care, uh, but that was organized by the Diocese of Mississippi on the Gulf Coast, and that was a, a project of Episcopal Relief and Development uh, to help families uh, gut their homes and rebuild. We did a similar thing um, after Sandy uh, in my own diocese, the Diocese of New York, where we live. So it's a long-term um, process. Uh, first, we get in, or even before the disaster strikes, we're trying to strengthen the capacity of the church uh, to respond. Uh, and then after the uh, church, uh, after the disaster strikes, also strengthen the capacity or support the church as it, it reaches out. I should also mention Puerto Rico. Um, it is a, uh, another diocese of, of the Episcopal Church. Uh, they were spared, for the most part, um, terrible uh, damage during Irma. Uh, it is not clear yet uh, the damage for Maria. I mean, it's, we know that there's no power there and there's not likely to be power for quite some time. Uh, there are major complexities uh, with Puerto Rico because of its um, own financial problems. Um, and Episcopal Relief and Development will, as we do, work through the local Episcopal Church to meet the daily needs of, of the communities and the people who present themselves. Uh, we place a heavy emphasis uh, in all of our work, whether it's our relief work or our development work, 
in identifying the people most in need. The services that we support have to be given out on the basis of need, not religious affiliation. So uh, while Episcopalians may be in need, <laughs> they sh and they can certainly get support, it's not limited to Episcopalians. And we really push our, our church partners, um, whether, it, again, it's internationally or domestically, to go out into the communities, to go out into the, to the, uh, to the local um, uh, uh, villages around them and to find the people who perhaps have fallen through the cracks. Uh, in the US, that's gonna be undocumented people who are afraid to present themselves uh, to this kind of official sources of, of aid. Um, and uh, it's gonna be people who are not necessarily in sitting in, in the church pews of the Episcopal Church. Uh, it's not uncommon. Um, for me, you know, on the morning, my routine is to go to the gym and to work out on the elliptical machine, watch the headlines from CNN. And, uh, you know, you'll, I'll hear about a tornado that's touched down in some corner of the United States. And I'll get to the office and I'll call the bishop and I'll say, you know, I see a tornado struck in this town, it's in your diocese. And oh yeah, well, you know, um, no one was hurt in our parish, don't think we're gonna respond. I'm like, okay. Uh, you know, uh, the news showed a trailer park that had been destroyed, uh, you know. And then I'll wait. And very often it comes around that, oh, you know, actually we do see uh, neighbors who have been damaged and been hurt by this disaster. And then Episcopal Relief and Development is then in a position to step in and help that church or that diocese respond uh, to the community around them. The other piece of work that we do, and I'm sorry to go on so long on this, but it's, I'm sure, at the top of everybody's mind, that the Episcopal Church, I think, has a particular charism for is pastoral care. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I remember I was, I was, I, I was, I'd been on the job about eight weeks when Katrina struck. Um, and I am not a disaster response <laughs> expert. I've become one, uh, but I wasn't then. And uh, you know, I got on an airplane and I went to Baton Rouge, which is where most of the people uh, coming out of New Orleans were headed in the first instance, and where all the clergy from New Orleans had evacuated. And I was there with the bishop and uh, the standing committee of the diocese, and they're all talking about sort of what they're gonna do. Uh, and you know, I turned to the bishop and I said, you know, I think we need to go up to the convention center and begin to offer pastoral care to people because that's what's really needed right now in this moment. And that is, has been the style of the work. I mean, that's certainly the work that the Diocese of Texas has done, uh, at least initially with people who took uh, refuge in the convention center and the, the stadiums in, around Texas as a result of this. Um, you know, we went up to, in this instance, in Baton Rouge, and the only people the only people offering pastoral care were the Scientologists. And I said, you know what? <laughs> the Episcopal Church needs to plant its flag here. <laughs> so uh, that's a very important uh, piece of the work and that we recognize that we wanna take care of the whole person, uh, meet not just their, uh, their fiscal needs, but also their spiritual needs. So with that, let me stop. I'm happy to answer any questions, either about what you might have seen here on the video or anything I've just said. So have at it. Yes, please. Well, 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 I think there's a microphone. For video recording, it's helpful to the viewers uh, if we ask all questions or comments come through a microphone. So uh, Bill Reisner is going to be just lift your hand and he'll make sure to get that to you. Go ahead, Pam, right into the mic. Is it on? Yes. It is. Um, I wanted to ask about Haiti. Sure. Um, because uh, some years ago during the earthquake, um, there, there was an Episcopal technical school that sustained a lot of damage, and um, I wondered what the situation in Haiti is now, especially as all these other later disasters have yeah. overtaken the Caribbean. Yeah, uh, thank you for asking uh, about Haiti. Um, Haiti is a very challenging place to work. Uh, the Episcopal Diocese of Haiti actually is the largest Episcopal Diocese of the Episcopal Church. Uh, it had something like, or has something like 73 or maybe it's even 90 Episcopal schools across the country. Many of them were damaged uh, during the earthquake. Um, Episcopal Relief and Development's uh, work has been to supply the, to help with the rebuilding of schools uh, and also to supply the schools with sanitation systems, clean water, um, toilets and latrines and things like that. Um, I go to Haiti a couple times a year for various reasons. Um, 
The other uh, piece of work that we're, we, we worked on um, is uh, the St. Vincent School for the Handicapped. I don't know how many people are familiar with St. Vincent's, uh, it's now known as St. Vincent's Center for the Handicapped, but it's the only school in Haiti that serves handicapped children. Uh, and it was completely destroyed in the earthquake. Uh, they were in an interim facility uh, for a number of years in downtown Port-au-Prince. Um, th that I visited uh, about two and a half years ago. And my standard is if I wouldn't let my daughter go to that school, nobody else's kid should go to that school. And nobody else's kid should go to that school. Uh, so we uh, helped with uh, the generosity of, of a major donor, in fact, purchase a plot of land um, outside of downtown Port-au-Prince. I mean, this was uh, the part of Port-au-Prince where there were gunfights regularly in front of the gates of the school. I mean, it was not a, a good place for children for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and next month, October 16th, we're gonna cut the ribbon on the new school, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, the, we, we found a plot of land, uh, we've renovated a structure there, and we've created other structures for classrooms that are all handicapped accessible, that have proper um, you know, bathrooms, and all this kinds of stuff that you and I would expect for a school that serves uh, the handicapped. Um, in terms of the most recent disasters, Haiti actually did okay. Uh, after these most recent hurricanes. We offered assistance to the church in Haiti and they said, no, we're, we're good. We're, we're, we're not, uh, we're not, we didn't suffer much damage as a result of Irma or Maria. So um, Haiti's a long-term uh, uh, commitment of Episcopal Relief and Development. Uh, and uh, you know, there's still lots of work there to be done. Um, the bishop I know wants to rebuild the cathedral. Um, Episcopal Relief and Development does not build church buildings. Uh, uh, we recognize that church buildings matter, but that's not our bailiwick, and that's not why people give us money. They give us money to serve, uh, to meet human need, uh, not, not to, to build church buildings. So I know that that's a major priority for, for, uh, for the diocese as well, along with us, some other stuff. Yes, please. Thanks. Just to follow up on Haiti and in, into a broader area, um, Partners in Health sure. is one of the many organizations that works in Haiti, <clears throat> James Farmer and so forth. So my bigger question, I guess, is how do you work with relief with many other organizations? And if we take Haiti as a microcosm, yeah. how, do you, how do you communicate with other organizations and make sure you're not overlapping or leaving somebody out? Right. Great question. Um, and it's not just in the relief space. Of course, it's a long-term development space as well. So how do we coordinate with other organizations? Um, in the aftermath of, uh, of a disaster here in the US, there's something called VOAD, uh, which is the Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster. And every community has a local VOAD. And they're the locus through which coordination is supposed to take place, is supposed to take place. In all honesty, after a disaster, there's a lot of chaos, you know? and everybody of good faith trying to do the right thing. So there's often a sorting out period, um, but uh, you know, the Episcopal Church, and that's one of our disaster preparedness uh, um, initiatives, is to get local Episcopal dioceses and churches engaged in their local VOAD, so that they're coordinating with the Methodists and the Lutherans and the Red Cross and everybody else that's working and that we aren't all falling all over each other. Uh, Haiti was a, was a was a very special case. Uh, first of all, the destruction was extraordinary. Um, it was just, it really flattened all of the infrastructure, uh, both the, uh, the government structures, physical structures, and the, you know, the, the, the abstract structures that ran it. Um, and in that case, it was the UN that was tasked with uh, running the coordination. And our job as Episcopal Relief and Development was to get the local diocese into those meetings so that they would be coordinating with other NGOs uh, in terms of the response. Uh, but somewhat to our shock, those meetings were not held in French, they were held in English, which automatically cut out a lot of local Haitian NGOs, which I thought was a serious problem, especially since French is one of the official languages of the United Nations. So, you know, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, you know, I think everybody wants to cooperate and wants to work together. Uh, but it's, it's I, I would be misleading if I made it sound like it was perfect every time it's not. Um, as things go, continue, the number of players who stay on drops down significantly because there are, the, in a disaster, in the initial rescue and, and immediate relief recovery, everybody's there, you know, it's a huge, big, everybody's there. As long as Anderson Cooper is there, everybody else is there. <laughs> Once Anderson Cooper goes home, then it really winnows down to the people who have a long-term commitment, like partners in health 
like Episcopal Belief and Development. We have very good relationships uh, with all of those organizations. Um, and those are at every level, at my level, excuse me, at my level, at the staff level, uh, you know, we're parts of working groups on developing expertise and all kinds of stuff. Um, and the same holds true for our development work. Uh, malaria, I'll just take that as an example. Um, you know, in terms of malaria net distribution, which was the core of our program, every government had a, um, or has a, uh, I don't know, it's called something different in most, in each country, but it's essentially a coordinating body, the National Malaria Control Board is what it was called, and they would assign areas that individual NGOs were supposed to work on to avoid exactly the problem of people distributing nets to villages that had just gotten nets from somebody else. So there's a fair amount of coordination that goes on at that level. Um, we coordinate through ecumenical bodies. Uh, I coordinate through the Anglican Alliance with our Canadian and Australian partners. So you know, there's a, there's a lot of that that goes on. Thank you, great question. Yes, oh my goodness, uh, right here on the aisle. Thank you. This is a bit of a follow-on from the previous discussion, um, but it strikes me that um, particularly in the longer-term follow-up process that there's room for a lot of interfaith cooperation, um, you know, which could be very useful in terms of educating people about, you know, the humanness of all these different faiths. And I'm wondering whether there's any effort to try to encourage that kind of you know, Christian to Muslim to, you know, Jewish, uh, whatever, uh, faith communities in partnership um, and what that, how that could happen. Great question, and you set me up for one of the things I wanted to tell you about. Um, one of Episcopal Relief and Development's uh, key priorities, we've just started a new strategic period. It started on January 1, so we're in the process of turning around this super tanker. Uh, but one of our key priorities is uh, fighting gender-based violence. And we've had a program that has been sponsored by the UN Trust Fund in Violence Against Women in Liberia. That's where we've been incubating it and testing it and figuring it out. Um, and it's focused on uh, reaching uh, youth, including young men, uh, to help them understand A, what it is, and B, why it's a bad thing. And then also clergy, because clergy in many of these contexts are either unwitting or sometimes witting participants in perpetuating a lot of the circumstances that lead to high levels of uh, gender-based violence. We got noticed by our Islamic brothers and sisters who said, hey, you know, that's really interesting what Episcopal Relief and Development is doing with its clergy. And they've asked if they can use our curriculum for our clergy and adapt it for imams, which we are absolutely thrilled to do. Uh, we work on a, we encourage our partners to work on an interfaith basis all the time. Uh, you know, when we do a malaria training uh, on malaria net distribution, it's not just for the local Christians, it's for everybody. We get the witch doctor there, we get the, you know, the, the, the imams there, we get the local, all the local leaders, because you, know, you have to mobilize the entire community if you're gonna be successful and sustainable over the long run. So we put a lot of emphasis on that kind of work, yeah. Um, back to Puerto Rico for just a minute, since it's in the headlines. How does the lack of power affect the island, and how can you help address that problem? Or when it's, uh, yeah, what's yeah. The, tell us more about the problem. Well, the problem is just growing as we see it uh, in the news. Um, the lack of power interferes in everything. You can't pump gas, uh, you can't uh, charge your cell phones. I've got a text out to one of the members of our board is in, in Puerto Rico, uh, haven't heard from him. Uh, you know, it breaks down communication, so it's a huge problem. Um, in terms of what we as Episcopal Relief and Development can do, it's supplying things like generators. Uh, you know, we're not going to rebuild the power grid of Puerto Rico. We don't have the resources for that. Uh, but we can, you know, do some things in terms of providing generators and whatnot. Uh, and it's, 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 it's a band-aid on a much bigger problem. Uh, but the other thing that we can do is empower the local church there to be advocates for themselves with their government and with the U.S. government to get the power grid back up and running. Uh, you know, that's going to be achieved through advocacy uh, and, and people standing up and protesting uh, and saying this is just not acceptable. Yeah. There's some, uh, maybe over there and then up here. <laughs> Whenever um, something happens, and whether you're talking about an immediate disaster or a longer-term development issue, people in the, you know in the United States, people like us want to 
do something? And I'm wondering in this work, is there any role for short-term mission trips, volunteerism, that kind of thing, or is it better for people to stay home and send money instead? Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> um, it is better in the initial days of the disaster to stay home and send money. Um, you know, our phone rings literally the day it happens, and we want to get a youth group together to go down and help our friends in Texas. And as well-meaning as it is, it's not helpful because they are not prepared to receive people, they're not prepared to give groups meaningful projects and things like that. The time for that will come. Um, you know, mission, mission trips to, you know, uh, Texas for, in this instance, uh, potentially Puerto Rico if the diocese is interested in that, uh, to help with that kind of work. Um, we have on our database, on our website, something called Ready to Serve, where we collect names of individuals or groups that want to go. Uh, take, it's a short little survey where you fill out some of your skills. You know, we are Spanish speakers, or we have these kinds of plumbing skills, whatever it might be, so that when the diocese is ready, they have a place to go and say, okay, these people have held up their hands and, and they're willing to go. Um, Episcopal Relief and Development does not sponsor international mission trips. Um, it really runs, frankly, against our philosophy. Uh, which is to identify local resources in the community and have the local community do for itself, because that's what's gonna make it sustainable over the long term. That's what we mean by asset-based community development. Having said that, uh, we do do pilgrimages, where we take groups um, to visit the programs of Episcopal Relief and Development. Uh, the presiding bishop just this last year uh, did a pilgrimage uh, with us and a number of bishops and other uh, friends and supporters to Ghana. Uh, to visit the work that we're doing in northern Ghana, uh, particularly with uh, malaria prevention and uh, women's economic empowerment. Um, we do two or three of those a year, um, and if anybody's interested in learning more about them, come up to me afterwards and I'll give you my card and you can send me your email. We're in the beginning stages of planning another one uh, for 20, what are we in, 20, we're 2018, and then also another, not necessarily to Ghana, uh, uh, another one to 20, uh, to, to someplace else in 2020. I'm taking a group to Myanmar uh, in November. Uh, we've had a long-standing program in Myanmar. Um, and since I've mentioned Myanmar, the Rohingya uh, is a terrible, awful tragedy. And that's an example where we're working with a Muslim organization to help serve them. Uh, Islamic Relief Worldwide uh, is an excellent partner. They have programs that are directly uh, dealing with the internally displaced folks within Myanmar. And then we're also in the process of identifying, probably through an ecumenical uh, agency, a partner in uh, Bangladesh to help with the, the camps. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Related to that question, sure. if your time to promote that book that you and I were talking about? Sure. Um, Toxic Charity uh, uh, is a great book. Um, if you haven't uh, read it, I commend it to you. Remind me who the author I'm is. <laughs> Robert Lipton, right. It's a, it's a wonderful book. It talks about the unintended consequences of, of these, uh, of, of mission trips. It's a yeah. great book. Yeah. I saw some questions on this side. Yes, you've had your hand up for a long time, right there. Well, the oh. microphone is coming. My question was, was handled um, the last issue, but um, I guess my follow-up question is, what do you recommend for churches that want to involve youth or youth groups in important work? You know, what is the most positive way to approach that, sure. in your opinion? Yeah, we have a number of, if you go to our website, we have a number of curriculum on our website for all ages, all the way from little kids to young adults. Uh, one of the um, programs that has been very successful is something that we call the Abundant Life Garden Project, which is, um, you know, a, 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 an effort to teach young people uh, about sustainable development. So it's a teaching curriculum by having them grow a garden in their own where they are. So it's a lot of churches have taken parts of their, their, their property and given them over to uh, gardening. Uh, and there's a curriculum that goes along with that that teaches about sustainable development um, in a global context, but also has a local application. Some people use the food that comes out of it to, uh, for a homeless shelter, for a food kitchen, something like that. You know, um, our work is predominantly international, but you know, this parish is an excellent model of local outreach. Uh, there's plenty of work to be done right in our local communities, and, and that's a good place for youth to do it. 
Um, and you know, by using some of our curriculum, you can uh, relate some of the things that are happening here locally to the kinds of things that are happening in the work that we're doing internationally as well. Yes, up here. Do you have any connection to the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem, Middle East? Any work going on there? Yes, um, we have a long-standing relationship with the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem in the Middle East. Um, the work that uh, we've supported in the past, there, there are a number of wonderful institutions there, predominantly schools. Uh, we've supported them in the past. We've supported the hospital in Gaza, uh, particularly when it's, it's, uh, there's conflict in Gaza. But our long ongoing program right now is focused around the Holy Land Institute for the Deaf. Uh, in Jordan, uh, which falls under the Diocese of Jerusalem in the Middle East. Um, they have uh, done just extraordinary work with Syrian refugees that are coming into uh, Jordan. Um, you know, the, the refugee camps are all being run by the global alphabet soup of NGOs that run that kind of stuff. The problem is, is that the ones that fall through the crack are handicapped kids. First of all, there's a lot of social stigma about handicapped, uh, being handicapped and having a handicapped child. So children are often, handicapped children are often held back, not, not sent to school. So the Holy Land Institute for the Deaf has developed programs that go into the camps, help identify families that have handicapped kids and ensure that those handicapped kids are getting the kind of support they need. And that's something that Episcopal Relief and Development has been supporting through, um, through the ministries of Holy Land, uh, of the Diocese of Jerusalem in the Middle East. Another question back here. You were having to run all over the place. Sorry about that. I'm trying to group them geographically. <laughs> Hi. Uh, slight top, a topic change, but I know a lot of the communities where um, you're doing development work are communities that are the front lines of impacts from uh, climate change and yep. human-caused climate change. Could you talk a little bit about how climate change is impacting like the choices you're making in development decisions and in, especially in frontline communities that are uh, the most impact in their water and agriculture? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, in addition to uh, the three priorities for fiscal relief and development in the upcoming, in the current strategic plan are women through working on gender-based violence, children through working on early childhood development and climate. Um, climate is having a huge impact across our entire programmatic uh, work, whether it's uh, here in the United States, so the intensity of these hurricanes has just skyrocketed, the frequency, uh, and then in the communities where we're doing agricultural programs, just to pick an example, uh, when we were in northern Ghana, you know, the rains don't come anymore. They used to be able to get two crops in in a year, and now they're only getting one crop in. So a lot of what we're doing is helping communities with adaptation techniques. Uh, so, you know, drought-resistant seeds, for example, uh, shifting agricultural practices, <coughs> things like that. Because most people don't want to leave where they are. They want to continue to live as they've lived with their families in their villages. That's what they know. The problem is, is that climate is driving a huge amount of migration, uh, particularly in Africa. You, you've seen um, perhaps some of the internally or refugees internally displaced people within Africa. A lot of that is driven by climate change. So. Our objective is to try to make it sustainable and, and possible for people to stay as long as they can uh, by adapting some of the stuff that they're doing uh, where they are. So building resilience in the communities and, and things like that. Uh, we're also working through our partners, the uh, Anglican Board of Mission of Australia, which is our counterpart agency uh, in the Solomon Islands because uh, the salinization of the soil as a result of rising sea levels is making it impossible for people to continue to live there. So we're actually having to look, unfortunately, helping some communities relocate. Um, it's, it pervades everything. Um, and there's a, it's, it's increasing the malaria zone. You know, we've made huge strides globally on the reduction of malaria, but it's now, you know, uh, mosquitoes are now flying further than they have ever been before. So we're finding new areas that have never had high incidences of malaria with malaria spiking uh, as a result of, of the shifting climate. Yeah, sir. A three-part question. Uh, I'll try to remember well, all three. <laughs> <laughs> What's your budget and how are you funded and how does it break down between relief versus development? Sure. Very good question. Um, our, our, our sort of steady state budget, the steady, meaning you know, year on year kind of core budget, is between 23 and $25 million a year. Um, 
it goes up when we have disasters. So next year, uh, this year, it will have gone up more than that because many of you have sent us donations that need to be put to work. So uh, we didn't plan for these hurricanes to happen. We didn't budget them. So those will be you know, additional things. Our board is already revising our budget. So I don't know where we'll end up this year, but it'll be an outlier year overall. So you know, 23 to 25 million a, a year. Second part of your question was? How is it funded? How is it funded? Funded by you. Um, really, uh, nearly 80% of the resources of Episcopal Relief and Development come from donations uh, from people sitting in churches around the United States. Uh, you have been incredibly generous. The church as a whole has been incredibly generous uh, to us. We get about 20% of our money uh, from non-church sources. Uh, so uh, the Gates Foundation has funded us. The Hilton Foundation has funded us. The, uh, the USAID has funded us. Uh, uh, the, the, the Cargill Foundation, there are a lot of foundations that have funded us over a number of years and at any given point a certain number of those are, are part of our funding stream. Uh, the Episcopal Church as a whole uh, provides us with a lot of in-kind support. Uh, so it's, um, uh, you know, we, we don't have to pay for our office space, for example, uh, in New York. So they handle a lot of our back office stuff, the financial processing, so that we don't have to pay for that. So that allows us to deploy um, even more of your donor dollar to the actual program itself, because the church on the other, uh, on the other side has picked up a lot of those expenses. And then the third part of your question? Relief versus? Relief versus, again, you know, that depends entirely on world events. When we started this year, it would have been about two-thirds development, one-third relief. Um, that will probably change just because of the scale of the disasters here in the United States. I don't know where we'll come out, maybe 50-50. It's just, I just don't know at this point. But again, when we're steady state, it's about two-thirds development, one-third uh, relief. We, we, I think in our annual summary, which you can get on, on the website of Episcopal Relief and Development in the financial section, we have, a, we have a diagram, a pie chart that shows what it was, not for 2017, but for 2016. We need to stop at what, about 11? Uh, you know, people start going to pick their kids up from church school okay. in about nine minutes. Okay. So All right. So well, this is a, maybe, I don't know if you can do this in nine minutes. Um, <laughs> so you've talked about so many different countries and so many different kinds of, of relief. How do you, uh, as an organization, stay focused? Um, and uh, then the, the second half is, and uh, what can we do to, uh, to help? Sure. Uh, great question. Um, so what do, what do we do as an organization to stay focused? Um, and it, it's interesting. This is a big discussion that we, the board and the staff, have been going through as we've developed our new strategic plan. Um, because we've evolved pretty uh, substantially in the 12 years I've been involved, at least. Um, and one of our board members, I'll use a, 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 described us as a smorgasbord, where you could come to Episcopal Relief and Development, you could get a helping of malaria prevention, and you could get a helping of clean water, and you could get a helping of you know, any number of different things. Um, and uh, what we have done in this strategic plan is to shorten the smorgasbord and put a few signature dishes on it, things that we're actually good at that other organizations perhaps can't do as well as we do. Um, we've placed a heavy emphasis in all of our programs on very, very rigorous monitoring evaluation. So we have evidence that shows that we're actually really good at early childhood development. So let's reorient our program to make that a key focus. We're really good at gender-based violence, so that will be a, a key thing. And then on the climate resilience question, it's just everywhere, uh, and, it, and it interweaves all that we do. Um, so that is how we, you know, tend to, to have just narrowed it and really identified those, those key priorities as the most, as the public-facing priorities of the work. Um, you know, we are responding to the requests of our partners as well. You know, we've got, uh, our, our methodology is to work through Anglican church networks. So, you know, the church in Zambia or the church in El Salvador, wherever it may be, has their own priorities. And some of those align with us and some of them don't. So the ones that align with us are the ones that we're going to help them uh, develop on. Um, you know, we often get uh, requests, well, not so much lately, um, you know, a lot of, uh, and there, I don't think, are there any bishops in the room? Uh, <laughs> bishops tend to like to have buildings with their names on them. Um, and I get a lot of requests. We need to, we have a health problem in my community and we need a hospital and it's going to be the Bishop so-and-so hospital. And, you know, those are expensive. 
uh, and the huge capital investment up front, of course, and then to just keep them going. You know, uh, if the government's not going to take over to run it, uh, it's not going to be sustainable over the long run. So we, we, we will hopefully negotiate with that bishop and say, you know, how about let's train, you know, a thousand community health workers and give them bicycles so that they can go out and do preventative health care, um, take the services to the people as opposed to building something and hope that they'll come to it, which most people can't, aren't, aren't going to get there. Um, so we, we, we like to do things that are low complexity, high impact. That's really our sweet spot, low complexity, high impact. Um, and uh, so that's the sort of the matrix that we run it through as we're, we're thinking about it. So what can you do to help? Um, spread the word. You know, I'm always surprised at how many people don't know about Episcopal Relief and Development. Um, and I, it's not just because I live and breathe it every day, but, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's not as visible as I would like in the Episcopal Church. We're more visible around disasters because it gives some things, a church an immediate thing to plug into. But our long-term development work is equally, if not more important in some ways, uh, than, than the rest of it. So all of you go out and be evangelists uh, for the work of Episcopal Relief and Development. That would be a, a huge help. And of course, continue to support us. Rob, may I perhaps even ask a final question sure. here? Um, you shared a great story with us this morning from the pulpit, uh, a real life story of someone whose life has changed. Um, I'm sure that this job and the duties of being the president of ERD can at times feel so overwhelming. Um, do you, what do you go back to? Is there a, a story or a, an image or something that helps reconnect you with why you do what you do day in and day out? Uh, thank you, that's a, a great question. Um, it's a great privilege that I have to come and talk to churches like this. I find this kind of um, opportunity hugely invigorating and exciting to see the enthusiasm and to be able to thank our donors. So that sustains me through this, a lot of it. Uh, and then also, uh, you know, being able, and I realize it's a huge privilege, uh, to be able and go and sit in the village and listen to the Mother's Union talk about how malaria has dropped in their communities as a result of the work that Episcopal Relief and Development has done. You know, we're like any other organization. Do I love every budget meeting I have to go to? Absolutely not, you know? Uh, do I love all of the HR hairballs that invariably end up in the president's inbox? Not so much fun. But at the end of the day, I can go home and say, you know, I, because I and my colleagues, it isn't just me, we showed up today, some kid somewhere is getting a vaccination, or somebody somewhere has a more nutritious meal, or somebody somewhere who's suffering from a disaster got a bottle of water today, you know, and, and to try to really boil it down to those, those kind of concrete things. And, you know, I've long ago reconciled myself to, um, you know, we're not gonna ch change everything, but we can change as much as we can. You know, and it, it's our responsibility and my responsibility to show up every day and try to do the best we can. And that's going to have to be enough. Uh, and we need to, to just to, to, to do that and to inspire other people to show up as well. I'd just like to make one comment in closing because I forgot to say it this morning during announcements and it was one of the most important things. And that is that St. John's Outreach Committee has given $7,000 to the hurricane relief effort of Episcopal Relief and Development, and the op shop, I believe, has given $3,000 of its own, so $10,000 from St. John's for hurricane relief to Episcopal Relief and Development, and thank you, St. John's. Thank you, Anne. I have a, a small gift to present, Episcopal Relief and Development swag. Uh, so. Um, here is, uh, let me just pull it out. Oh, we have the Gifts for Life catalogs are out there, which is our uh, alternative gift market. A lot of churches organize during their Christmas fairs and things like our holiday fairs, an alternative gift market. Uh, we also have um, some uh, fair trade coffee that you can get through uh, one of our uh, partners. And um, because I'm sure you wear hats in the sunshine just like I do, we have a ball cap for you. So thank you, thank you, thank you very thank you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you.